The word baptism, it literally means to dip. Nobody really wanted to call this great right of the church dipping. And besides, to the politicians of the day, it sounded like fully immersing someone in water. So the Greek word baptizo was taken straight into the Latin and then straight into the English. You see, there's something about baptism that always gets the theological and political arguments going. In our patch of Anglicana, for example, one can, within limits, create a communion liturgy quite distinct from those in the New Zealand prayer book, as we have done. You can also, within limits, help couples create their own marriage liturgies that are often quite distinct from anything in the New Zealand prayer book. With funerals, there are very few limits. We specialize in accommodating the dead. Yet with baptism, we're meant to follow the dictates of the New Zealand prayer book to the letter. Interestingly, very few parishes or priests do. Disobedience is rife. A number of church leaders see baptism as entry to the club, the church club. That's why some priests and parishes want parents to be well informed and committed to the doctrine and discipline of the church, including regular attendance before they will baptize children. This is why some priests and parishes are skeptical about children being baptized at all. How can children possibly be committed? And can parents, godparents, really be surrogates when it comes to commitment? In broad terms, there are two understandings of church here that are at odds. One understanding you could call gathered and the other understanding comprehensive. The gathered understanding sees church as those who attend, are on the parish roll and participate. Like a club, you know who is part of it and who isn't. The latter comprehensive understanding sees church as those attendees and non-attendees who try even occasionally to live the way of love, justice and compassion known in Jesus. I don't think you have to be clairvoyant to know where I am in my understanding of church. For those of us then of a comprehensive bent, baptism is not so much about entry into an organization called the church but about celebrating our entry into this whole wide sacred world. The world's not an evil place from which children and others must escape. Rather, the world, like the church, is infused with godness. At baptism, we celebrate our immersion into the life and mystery of the sacred that is all around us. Baptism isn't about erecting boundaries, it's about God rejecting boundaries. It's about God's yes to each and every one of us, even to a little child. God's yes is the energy, mystery and source of all life, tenderly and lovingly embracing us, not because we're special, but because everyone is special. So baptism, therefore, is not about proclaiming our commitment so much as God proclaiming God's commitment. It's not proclaiming that we love God, but that God loves us. In baptism, the child does not so much acquire some new identity or magical blessing from on high. Rather, the community simply acknowledges who that child always has been and might potentially become in the embrace of the God called love. One of the ongoing tasks of the church 
is wrestling with language. Language can't contain God. God's bigger than words. Words also change in meaning. Some words important in the past are no longer real for people in their daily life and work. Words like saviour, lord, sin. Some old words are important enough to reinterpret, but most aren't. In a baptism liturgy, cramming a sentence full of outdated church words might satisfy some theological purist, but it's nonsense to the many people who require to say it. One of our tasks, therefore, is finding words that do make sense, that do have meaning and connect with people's lives. In the New Zealand prayer book, Liturgy of Baptism, after hearing quoted a passage from the Book of Acts about receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit, the parents are asked, how do you respond to this promise? Their response is prescribed. We hear God's call and ask for baptism. Well, the question is problematic. What is the promise of the Holy Spirit? Come on, Pat, you've been in church for years and years and years. What is this promise of the Holy Spirit? We've all been here. What is this promise of the Holy Spirit? And what is it in language that makes sense to our daily life today? Further, the idea of telling parents the words they have to say in response seems to my mind to be quite revealing. There's a subliminal institutional message. We want you to think as we tell you to think. We don't want to hear anything different or original from you. We don't want to hear your beliefs. Rather, we want you to fit into ours. And then there's this notion of call. Do you have to feel called by God, however you understand that phrase, in order to bring a child for baptism? Let me be personal. I don't feel called to go to church, celebrate life, join with others in working for change. I don't feel called to go to parties, host parties, or recover from parties. There are lots of things I do because they are a part of who I am. Bringing my children to be baptized is no great existential decision. It's simply a part of who I am. The second question, same as the first, a little bit longer and a little bit worse. Do you renounce all evil influences and powers that rebel against God? Church think has this historical hang up with evil. The question sounds innocent enough, but why are we asking questions about evil at baptism? Why not ask them on Ash Wednesday or Good Friday? This question is a legacy from the days when the church considered kids to be born evil and baptism supposedly washed out the evil as God poured in the good. It's nonsense. Third question. Do you trust in Christ's victory, which brings forgiveness, freedom, and life? Well, the forgiveness, freedom, and life sounds good, doesn't it? What's the bit about victory? Well, it's military language, and it was applied as one metaphor amongst many to understand the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's all that stuff about big cosmic battles, Lord of the Rings style. And while it makes for good fantasy, depending on your preferences, it doesn't connect with the reality of most people today. Unless you're George Bush or Ronald Reagan or somebody like that. The parents' prescribed response to this question is, in faith I turn to Christ my way, my truth, my life, as I care for this child. Well, to be frank, it sounds like the writing committee had a bit much piety on their cornflakes that morning. I don't think there'd be many of us who'd want to stand up and declare Christ is my way, my truth, my life. And what does that mean? And who says that to be a committed Christian, you have to own a statement like this? And more importantly, why are we asking this of parents 
prior to their children being baptised. It's club think, requiring parents to recite what some in the church believe is a precondition. Well, like you heard this morning, I've been offering open questions to baptismal families now for 22 years. Sometimes people don't put any thought into it or are a bit nervous to express what they really think. But time and again, more often than not, I hear some wonderful things, things said from the heart, their commitment and love of their child, their hopes for the child's future. It's from their heart, addressed to all our hearts. The wonders of sacred love in people's lives are magnificent. And it's not something that can be contained and controlled by the church. The sad thing is that without creating an environment for open questions, the church will never hear this wonderful love. The fifth and last question in the approved baptism prayer book service is a good one. We asked this morning, how then will you care for this child? Uh, and the set response is I will love and share my faith with him or her. This question provides the opportunity for parents and godparents to talk about their commitment to their child. It's another opportunity to put deep feelings into words. Knowing oneself loved makes a world of difference and makes the world different. Being loved for who you are rather than for what you can become or who your parents are or how big your IQ is or what your face looks like, but just being loved innately for who you are can enable and energize and transform a person to exercise their gifts and abilities more freely and confidently. It's somewhat intangible, this thing we call unconditional love, and yet it empowers the one loved to give of who they are. And it is at the heart of this ritual of baptism. A number of years ago, I officiated at a baptism service, actually in the parish of Glen Innes, that had a little bit of a difference. And the difference was this paddling pool. It's about two meters by two meters. And it was surrounded by native plants. The family had asked me where they could do this. And I said, oh, oh yes. <laughs> And there was a young totara tree with the, with the ferns. And when the time came to christen the child, the mother handed me this naked baby, whom I sat in the pool and proceeded to put water over her head. And while this was happening, the child's oldest sister, not wanting to miss out on the fun, stripped off and jumped in the pool too. And then the mother, anticipating this and suitably attired, also got into the pool. The congregation were deeply moved by this service. The abundant water seemed to symbolize the love of God that the baby entered in and splashed in, naked, unashamed, and uninhibited. The family, too, immersed themselves in this love as they paddled together. The congregation also got a bit wet to say nothing of the floor, <laughs> had a leak. <laughs> At the conclusion of the service, the whole congregation followed the family outside to plant the young totara in the church grounds, taking water from the paddling pool to give the totara its first drink. It was as if love was surrounding and sustaining the planting and growth of something new and powerful. In the beginning, we belong. We belong before we claim that we belong. We belong to our parents and family, to the Christian community, to the wider community. Primarily, however, we belong to that which is transcendent, unfathomable, and mysterious love, that which we call God. And it's in this belonging to the God called love that can draw us beyond the confines of self-interest 
As we grow up, we discover who we truly are and who we truly can become. We grow up to learn that this God of love draws us from being a bystander and invites us to plunge into the beauty, misery, passion, and wonder of our world. 